Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Hmm. Wow, only 10 compiles an hour? Well, I think that's something we could probably deal with. Yeah, sure. All right, I'll plan on it. We've got a build to do. We've been called into work today for none other than Mr. Greg Crow Hartman. Number two on the Linux kernel. What does he need? He doesn't need a workstation. He's still rocking his ultra high end Threadripper system, 32 cores of uh, monstrous insanity, but also not super loud. I get it. I work on stuff too and I want lots of horsepower and it's quiet and powerful. It's really hard to do. So now he needs more horsepower. Not in a workstation class, but in a server class. See, they need a build server. We did another video talking about KC Bench and KC Bench Rate. It's kernel compile benchmarks. But it's not just compiling the kernel. You also have to compile the drivers and everything else. And you would think, you know, maybe the workflow for that could be improved. You could rearrange the header files and get some more performance out of it. Yeah, that may help for the future, but don't forget we've got long-term kernels that have to be supported. So what do we do? We, we do what most companies do. We throw hardware at it. So much hardware. So this, this is the smallest possible build. If you want a high-end system like this, this is 128 cores. You already know what you're getting into. 128 epic cores. This is pretty much the smallest dual epic that you can build. Dual 280 millimeter radiators. Heck, we even threw in an RX 6900 XT. This could just as easily be an MI50 or some other instinct card for machine learning. You could put up to a terabyte of memory in this. This is the Salvo Studios case for this kind of nonsense. Yes, this is a custom loop. We got our pump and reservoir on the back. I did a separate video on this. As awesome as this is, this is not for someone like Mr. GKH because this is not a zero maintenance for 10 years system. So what do we do? We do a build. First up, the processors. This, this is a care package from AMD. The angels have heard our prayers. This is $20,000 of processors. 7763, 128 cores in this box for Mr. GKH. Sponsored by AMD. Thank you very much, AMD. So that's the most important thing. Now why the 7763s? Why does it have to be the 64 cores? Is that just a flex? No, we did the, the video on that. You can check out the KC Bench stuff. Even the 7713 64 core CPUs, which are the lower clock rate 64 core Epic CPUs, could outrun the 75F3 CPUs. Now the 75F3 CPUs, those are 32 cores, but they clock up to four gigahertz. They are insanely fast. For any kind of mixed workload, those CPUs are unstoppable for anything else on the planet. But for this kind of a job, more cores went out over clock speed. And I'm surprised by just how much. These 7763 CPUs for the kernel 5.15 benchmark, they're gonna be doing around 30 kernels per hour with the full module config, no cache, everything else like that. The 75F3 could do 22, 23, but for this system, for the absolute maximum number of kernels per hour, 30. That's moving up from 10 on his 32 core system. So it's not a linear scaling either, moving from 32 to 128 cores. We don't really have a linear scaling to the number of kernels per hour that we can expect. But we also found that adding a second socket does help us in a much more linear way than adding more cores per socket, because we tested 32 core in one socket, 64 cores in one socket, 32 cores per socket in two sockets, and finally 64 cores in two sockets. This is the best hardware for the build. So, what's next? There's pretty much only one case choice, the Fractal Torrent. Why? Because it's got giant fans. This is the MZ72HB0. The box is almost not labeled. In fact, the box actually isn't labeled. There's a sticker. This is super nice eco-friendly. This motherboard is the unstoppable fire-breathing motherboard that can supply 280 watts per socket to this thing without overheating. So, this is a server motherboard. It is designed for a server chassis. The torrent is not a server chassis, but it also has to be quiet. This is the best fit for retro converting a server motherboard 
into a desktop, into a tower server, without really giving up a lot, assuming that you don't need a lot of two and a half inch drives, you don't need a lot of, uh, of other connectivity other than just a place to stick a motherboard. I'll also mention the Lee & Lee Dynamic XL. This is a runner up because it could hold two power supplies, but it's not really possible to configure the power supplies in a redundant fashion. So for the power supply, we're going with an FSP Group power supply. FSP Group is a huge company. They make all kinds of server power supplies. They do everything, you know, all aces in terms of power supplies. They have an ATX sized power supply that actually has two power supply modules. That's what we're gonna be using for the power supply on this build. And for the coolers, we're doing something a little unusual, the Freezer 4U SP3. Now it's easy to imagine at some point in the future, Mr. GKH may transfer this to a rack mount case. These fans are compatible with rack mount 4U configurations. So that's really awesome. But these, these coolers will also keep our 280 watt CPUs under control, which is nice. Now you might be wondering, why not Noctua? Well, I do have Noctua in the system behind me, which is basically identical. Same motherboard and same case. That's why I was so impressed with this case. You might think the horizontal CPU configuration is part of the reason why I went with Arctic. That's not really the whole thing. This push-pull configuration with two fans, the Noctuos are gonna do a little bit better for CPU cooling for the testing that I've done. This room's a little warm, even with the side on. Now, if you're gonna do this with Noctua, you're gonna have to use a 120 and a 140. Two 140 side by side, perfectly in line like that. It was a little tight and the airflow over the VRMs was a little bit more impeded. With the smaller one in the front, the 120, again, a push-pull configuration. It seems like there's enough turbulence that the VRMs get the airflow that they need. Big reason is that 4U mountability. These will not fit in a 4U case, but GKH could transplant his system into that 4U rack mount system, and that'll work a little better with the Arctic configuration. Strictly speaking, the performance of the Arctic coolers is on par with these Noctua coolers in this configuration. So, no complaints there, really. Now for the memory. Do you not have any idea how hard it is to get memory in the current climate? Sponsored by level one, because that's all we could do. SK Hynix. I'm pretty sure that I'm gonna use this SK Hynix HMAA4 GR7AJR8N. These are 32 gig DIMMs. This is only gonna give him 512 gigabytes of RAM. I mean, if you're building a system like this, don't you at least want a terabyte? I mean, come on. But because nobody wants only 512 gigabytes of RAM, these are actually pretty affordable. So I'm happy about that. Yes, we're using eight DIMMs per socket because we've got 64 cores. We need as much memory bandwidth as we can possibly get. And yes, those are dual rank DIMMs and they are 3200. So this is gonna really, really sing. Now, full disclosure, Arctic did send us one of these but I used it in another build. So both of these are also courtesy level one techs. Look at that cooler, it's all heat pipe. All heat pipe all the time with dual fans, comes pre-installed, plenty of clearance for RAM. It's not like our RAM's gonna have wings, but you do want airflow around your RAM and the way that these are engineered, this really works. Also note the orientation. It's gonna work really well with our torrent. This version of the torrent, No tempered glass, it's just metal. The FCC will be so happy. You might be thinking, this case is a little pricey. Five fans, and two of them have more volume plastic than three other fans, so it's like you've got seven fans. Our FSP group power supply, it needs about 700 millimeters of clearance, but guess what, the torrent's got that. And at the back, depending on what Mr. GKH's uh, storage needs are, how they evolve over time, he could run a RAID 1 of mechanical spinning rust because spinning rust is so unreliable, you should really at least run RAID 1. But we've also got a, a ton of two and a half inch bays back here that yes, we'll be more than happy to fit our storage. Which brings me to the storage part. Keoxia is hooking up Mr. GKH. So they're gonna provide some U.2 storage for the server. I'm gonna use some breakout cables or possibly even a PCB. So probably something like this. This is two U.2s on a single PCIe carrier. It's really tough to get PCI Express 4 carriers like this. And actually, strictly speaking, I don't think the carriers are PCI Express 4 because some of the ones that I've got, they'll work at PCI Express 4 speeds and the upper slots on the motherboard, the ones that are closer to the CPUs, 
but they will not work in the ones that are farther from the CPUs, which is a signal integrity issue. The, the PCB really doesn't do much to ensure PCI Express 4 signal integrity other than physically locating the connectors as close as possible to the card edge connector. So that's something, but uh, I'll definitely make sure it's reliable before sending it out. Now, again, before you've even ordered the first part, I know that the system is amazing and you just wanna rip your wallet open right now and order this without thinking about it, but I can't stress enough, you should not do that. You should know exactly what problem it is that you're trying to solve before you ever spend the first dollar. Sometimes it's hard. You might, you might have to, you know, uh, co-opt some time on a friend's machine or reach out to me and say, hey, I'm trying to do this job. Maybe it'll make for an interesting video. Let's figure out this academic or this research problem. Rent some time in the cloud and see what works and what doesn't. I mean, if you look at the other videos in the lead up to this, we tried many, many, many different system configurations and ultimately the 7763 system, it stomped them all. So here we are to build day. This is not a problem that Amazon is gonna solve. This is not a problem that bare metal in the cloud is gonna solve. Heck, we even tried dist CC, distributed C compiling, just cause I was curious. It's like, well, two sockets is good. Four has gotta be better, right? It wasn't worth the headache. I do love Gigabyte's eco-friendly motherboard boxes. Look at that. Oh, it's so beautiful. And look at that. Big, tall VRM heat sinks because 280 watts per socket. 10 gigabit LAN plus IPMI onboard VGA. We've got Gen 4 breakout plus onboard M.2. Man, this thing is sweet. Now I am working at my anti-static workstation. So make sure you have an anti-static workstation too. Maybe one of the gamers Nexus mod mats. Those are nice. <laughs> All you get in the box is a couple SATA cables, which we're not using, the rear IO shield, <laughs> and this. This is a motherboard installation manual for people that know what they're doing. Yo dog, here's the connectors. Good luck. By the way, we're on Facebook. Like and subscribe. Now on this Gigabyte motherboard, these CPU sockets are not offset at all. They're perfectly in line. So one heatsink is gonna feed the other. I'm a little worried about that, but we'll do some testing and make sure that it's okay. I'm also not gonna mount the coolers just yet. It's, it's sometimes a good practice to mount your coolers before you install your motherboard, but there's so much cooler here, um, I'm not gonna do that. And they're relatively close to the board. Might make it a little harder to screw in some of the screws. So I'm just gonna go ahead and mount this in the, uh, the, the fractal torrent case, and then we'll install those fans. So let's get the case. I've relocated our standoffs. Now the fractal case doesn't have one here at the front where this motherboard has one. So you can see the hole here on the back, this is a normal position, a normal ATX position, this screw, and it has the e ATX screw in line with that. The problem is that our dims are in the way. So that's moved down very slightly to be in line with this screw here. There is an extra standoff in the box. And so if you only have one or two standoffs that don't line up and everything else does, I'll show you a trick. Sometimes you can screw one standoff into the other one upside down, and then this will provide mechanical support. It doesn't fasten the motherboard to the case, but if you press down on the motherboard, it will provide some rigidity. And once again, we check all our screws. There's nine, remember, counting the one that's uh, a little arbitrary. In the last year, we've had four people come to the forum that have had problems with their motherboard that, or problems with their build that were mysterious and strange. And ultimately, it was because there was a standoff that wasn't supposed to be somewhere shorting something out. So it happens. Count one, two, three, four, five, six. This is the special one, seven, eight, nine. That's how many we had. Seems like we're in good shape. Warning, please peel off before you use. Good advice. What I really like about the design is this, the, the heat pipes are in direct contact with stuff. The IO die's got a couple of heat pipes and there's just, there's just heat pipes everywhere. So thermal paste, got my two tubs of MX-5. Now notice that these have airflow marked on them. And this is, you know, this is, there's an asymmetrical design here. Arctic has thought of things. If you're like me and the orientation's not what you need, you can flip which side's what. One thing you gotta be really careful about is when you're tightening this with your screwdriver, if you slip, you're gonna stab some RAM. 
And that's going to be a $200 mistake. Our airflow arrows are pointing the same way, even though our, our sockets are rotated on this motherboard and there's no offset. So I'm gonna have an adventure getting both of these fans in place. I, might, I may not be able to get both fans in place. We'll try it. Another nice feature of these Arctic fans is that it's a pigtail header, so you can have both fans feeding off of one header if you need to do that. And these server motherboards typically do not have a lot of headers, so it's a nice touch. Now, without the other fan in place on the back here, the VRM is gonna get more airflow, so I'm gonna leave that off for now. There is enough room for it to fit with zero gap. There would be no gap whatsoever. Now, the last and most important piece of this build is the power supply. Something very special. I reached out to FSP Group because this caught my eye and I said, hey, this is for a good cause. Will you uh, give us a power supply? <laughs> and I said, okay. So this is the Twins Pro 900 watt power supply. Twins Pro, it's a standard ATX form factor, but with the modular hot swap. Now it's not just one 900 watt power supply, it's dual 900 watts, but that doesn't mean that you can run 1800 watts off your, your system. It means that you've got, you know, primary and standby. So one of your power supplies could, could die and it doesn't matter. This is just overkill. I'm sure that, that Mr. GKH could run out and buy a power supply if something happens to the power supply, but I like redundancy. I would like to know that this thing will run maintenance free for like 10 years, knock on wood. Uh, and that's sort of what I want to give him. And FSP Group is a very well-known name in server power supplies. A very uh, A-list when it comes to server power supplies. So I'm pretty excited about this product. Now it is a little bit longer than normal power supplies. As I explained in the full video, you can, I did a sort of a dedicated video on this power supply. You should check that out. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's a little long. It's a little big, but that's okay. Well, we got the system set up. And I'm in this room, not really a lot of sound treatment. So you can hear just how loud it is. Now, it's not whisper quiet. And definitely the loudest thing in the system are those tiny power supply fans in each 900 watt module. But as you can hear, the power supply smartly ramps. Now it is whisper quiet when it's not doing anything, but right now <laughs> it's compiling a kernel. Load average is like 200, 300, something like that and it's this quiet. For that much horsepower, drawing almost 700 watts at the wall, that ain't bad. The hottest hotspot as reported by LM sensors is about 70 degrees C. I would like that to be a little bit better. It does feel like a blast furnace coming out the back of the case, but this is really pretty good for tower coolers and sustained load. Well, with this system complete, there's really only one thing left to do. It's just like in the Uptime Funk music video. I'm calling Greg Crow Hartman. Yeah, it's... It's ready. Oh, I think you're gonna be real excited. Let's do a chat soon. I'm gonna get this in a box, out the door, and on its way. Well, this is exciting for both of us. One, because I get to live vicariously through a kernel developer with uh, fire-breathing beastly horsepower, and another because he's gonna have fire-breathing beastly horsepower. Thanks again to AMD for providing the CPUs, Gigabyte for the motherboard, FSP Group for the power supplies. We're using Arctic coolers, the Arctic TR4 coolers. It's got a nice configuration in this case. Uh, I, level one picked up the memory and the, uh, the case and some other stuff because, hey, that's what our community wants us to do. And while this is level one, I'm signing out. You can find me in the level one forums. Oh, it's the boiler snake. Come to give it a, a good send off. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's boiler snake for what you're referring to as Linux is actually GNU Linux, or as it's taken to calling it recently, GNU plus Linux. <laughs>